Welcome to a discussion of radical fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, laissez-faire capitalism, and individual rights. The Yaron Brook Show starts now. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, well, I am I'm actually in London, London, England. It is uh, now uh, 5 p.m. I flew over just a few hours ago, so I'm a little jet lagged. A little tired. I don't sleep well on airplanes. I don't know about you guys, but I find it very difficult to sleep on planes and uh, didn't sleep much. So um, hopefully I won't be rambling today and uh, I'll be talking about, uh, you know, some people say I'm ramble all the time and hopefully I'll be coherent. Of course, there are those who claim I'm incoherent all the time. So uh, welcome, everybody. And uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's good to do the show and it's good to take you around the world as I travel to all these uh, wonderful places. I uh, already have had an opportunity to uh, to give a talk uh, here in London to uh, to students. And uh, that was uh, earlier this afternoon. I uh, talked about the morality of capitalism to about uh, 50, 60 students at uh, King's College, uh, students who belong to uh, European Students for Liberty, a, a kind of a libertarian student group, a free market student group that is uh, pretty active in Europe. I'll be speaking for this group again in in Poland the next week. Actually, next week, the Iran Brook Show is going to come to you from Warsaw, Warsaw, Poland. I mean, you, you're going to, if you keep track of the show, you're going to get a whole tour of the world. Uh, you already have because uh, we've already broadcast from Baku and Geneva and all kinds of places. So you get a glimpse into uh, into my life, traveling around the world, talking, speaking, debating, Capitalism, freedom, uh, every, everywhere. So uh, today was was a lot of fun. I got to I got to talk uh, in front of um, in front of sixty pretty motivated uh, students. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six more talks in the UK over the next week. Uh, five of them at universities, and uh, one of them at a big public forum, sponsored by the Adam Smith Institute. So hey, hey, hey this is going to be a lot of fun. I'm really going to be enjoying it, and uh, next week when I broadcast the show from uh, from Warsaw, I can tell you a little bit about how uh, how it's going. So uh, you, you'll get a little bit of insight into uh, into my travels. All right, a, a lot to talk about as always. There's just tons going on in the world, and uh, you know I find it all interesting and fascinating and uh, fun to discuss uh, with with all of you. Uh, it's um, I thought I'd start with, uh, I don't know, you know, this issue, what, what's making the top of the news? What makes the top of the news right now? I mean, th- this is kind of, I don't know, I don't know what to make of it exactly. You know, this Judge Moore stuff. So uh, Judge Moore is the Republican candidate for the Senate in Alabama. Um, as a Republican candidate for the Senate in Alabama, he should win. He should win easily. And he, I think he's still expected to win. But revelations came out through the Washington Post that he sexually harassed a, a, a young girl, a 14 years old, and then that he dated some women age 17, uh, 17 uh, when he was 32. So this is 40 years ago. Uh, he was 32, they were 17. So I, I, I get the big deal made out of the fact that he sexually harassed a 14 year old. I, I mean, absolutely. That, that's, that's criminal. That's, that's horrible. And uh, the idea that anybody would harass, uh, sexually harass anybody, but but particularly a 14-year-old, uh, is uh, is despicable. But but I find it interesting that he's also being, um, you know, really harassed for dating a 17-year-old. And you know, I don't I don't know. I, I, it just seems to me like a 32-year-old dating a 17-year-old may be unusual. Maybe the parents of the 17-year-old didn't like it. But if it was consensual, I don't see the big deal. And and. But more importantly than that, I, I want to put this all into the context of who this guy is, who Judge Moore is, and how all of this is making headlines, and Republican senators are withdrawing their endorsement of his uh, senatorial campaign, and uh, you know he, he he is being asked to uh, to withdraw. Now, again, if he if he sexually harassed a fourteen year old, he certainly should and. All this is justified, but put it into into perspective who this guy is. I don't think this guy is qualified to run for the Senate. Worse than that, I, I think it's abomination. 
an abomination that he's running for the Senate, and that he's got the endorsement of any Republican for the Senate. So just to give you a little background, uh, Moore was, uh, was a judge in the Supreme Court of Alabama. He was, the, he was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Alabama. He was removed from the bench in 2003 because he refused a court order, a federal court order, to take down a monument to the Ten Commandments in a state Supreme Court building in Alabama. Now, put aside whether you think the, 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 the Ten Commandments should be in a courtroom or not. The fact that a federal court ruled and that you refuse that ruling says that you do not respect the rule of law. You know, we all have rulings in the Supreme Court, in the federal courts, that we don't like, that we don't approve of, that, 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 that go against our beliefs. But we live in a, in a country of laws, and we abide by those laws. And in particular, if you are a judge in a Supreme Court, if you're a, a model, a symbol of the rule of law, you have to abide by the court's decision. And indeed, he was removed because he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. Then last year, he was suspended for the remaining of his term. So he, he was removed and then he went back on to the court. He was suspended for the remainder of his term after telling probate judges to enforce the ban on gay marriage which by then had been struck down by the U.S. Supreme Court. So here again, the U.S. Supreme rules. You might not like the ruling, but now you're telling government officials, government officials, whose job is to follow the Constitution, and in this case, whose job is to follow the rulings of the Supreme Court, because it is the voice of the Constitution. Like it or not, I, I most of the time I don't like it, but that's a fact. We live in a country of laws, not of men. You don't get to decide, but of laws. And he he told them to disregard the Supreme Court decision and to continue banning the marriage, gay marriage. Now, this is this is disrespect for the rule of law. This is disrespect for the Constitution. This is disrespect for America, for what America stands for. This is why... He should get no endorsements from Republican senators. This is why he should not have won the primary. This is why he should be at the top of the uh, of the news and people should be bemoaning the fact that he's a Republican candidate. This is why his nomination is destroying the Republican Party from within. How can you have a, 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 a senator endorsed by almost every Republican running who has no regard for the law, has no regard for the rule of law, has no regard for court decisions. Now, of course, this shouldn't be surprising to anybody because, after all, didn't President Trump just uh, pardon Joe Arapo, uh, you know, from Arizona, the sheriff, who, again, disregarded a court ruling. And it doesn't matter whether you agree with him on immigration or not. He disregarded the law. And, and he was a lawman. He was a sheriff. His job... His job is to execute the law, not his opinions, not his views, not his interpretation of the Constitution, not what he thinks is right. The law. That is what it means to be a lawman. That's what it means to be a judge. We are a country of laws and a Constitution, not a country of men, each one interpreting it any way they want and living and, 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 and enforcing what they feel like enforcing and not enforcing other stuff that they don't feel like enforcing. This is so anti-American. So anti-American, these two characters. And it's not like they resigned in protest. I mean, that, that's great. You should. If, if there's a ruling you disagree with, you write editorials, you speak up against it, you resign your position because you don't want to enforce the, the, the unjust law that was just, uh, you know, approved by the Supreme Court or whatever. Okay. But that's not what they did. They kept their positions. Judge Moore stayed in the court. Sheriff Arapo, uh, uh remained sheriff. And what they did was they just ignored the law. They just ignored the courts. And it, to me, it's tragic that Trump pardoned him. And it's tragic that Republicans are going to vote 
this guy into office. <sighs> now think about this. We have made a huge deal about um, about football players kneeling when uh, because of the anthem. It's disrespectful to America. It's disrespectful to the flag. It's disrespectful for the idea of America and the people who fight fought for America. I find Judge Moore's behavior a hundred times more disrespectful to the flag, a hundred times more disrespectful to the Constitution, a hundred times more disrespectful to what it means to be an American. He basically ignored the Constitution. He ignored the rule of law. He placed his interpretation, his views above the law and flaunted it. Wasn't embarrassed by it. He flaunted it. He, he, he's proud of it. He ran on that. And this is who we elect? We elect for senators? Now, when he passes laws as a senator, and when we ignore them, is he going to say, well, yeah, okay, anybody can ignore the law. That's the American way. You can do whatever the hell you want. No, it's not. So I would say that the, the lead story should be judge more as anti-American, Judge Moore is anti the Constitution, Judge Moore is anti the rule of law. And it therefore it doesn't surprise me, since this is a guy who takes the law into his own hands and does whatever the hell he wants, that he flaunts the law in, in sexual harassing, sexually harassing a young girl. I the whole dating thing doesn't bother me as much, but uh the sexual harassing, obviously, you go to jail for that. Uh, but but this issue, I, I just don't get it. I, I don't get why Americans don't get upset about this. I, I, maybe we don't believe in the rule of law. Maybe that's the lesson that that you know Obama didn't believe in the rule of law. I mean he he clearly didn't believe in it as as he didn't believe in contracts. He 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 you know he bailed out. You remember the bailout of Chrysler and GM where he just rewrote contracts. He ignored contracts. He ignored the law, and he just forced his solutions down people's throats. Maybe we've come to a point in America where we just accept that. We don't care anymore. Right, left, all we seem to care is what tribe you belong to. Oh, we like Judge Moore because he's on our tribe. He's on the Republican tribe. We hate Obama because he's on the other tribe. We hate that other tribe. Oh, that Democratic tribe. I'm on the Republican tribe. That's not what America's about. The founding fathers didn't even want political parties because they were so afraid of exactly this kind of tribal behavior. We're about individuals and measuring them and evaluating them. And if somebody like Judge Moore will not uphold the law when he is a judge, he does not deserve to be in the Senate. And I don't care who, I don't care if he's a Republican, I don't care if he's a Democrat. It does not matter. He does not deserve to be in the U.S. Senate. All right. We're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Run Book Show on the Blaze Radio Network. PhD, author, media contributor. This is the Yaron Brooks Show, the Blaze Radio Network. You're listening to the Yaron Brooks Show on the Blaze Radio Network. All right, so we were just talking about Judge Moore uh, ignoring the rule of law and, and decisions made by courts that he was supposed to abide by. And and I'm getting some pushback, I guess, on, on uh, social media as people saying, well, slavery used to be legal, but people fought against it to make it. It used to be legal, and people fought against it to make it illegal. Absolutely. And if you don't believe in gay marriage, fight against the law. If um, if you don't believe the immigration laws are good, elect different representatives and, and fight against the law. But if you are a government official, your job is to abide by the law. That is what you do. You do not have personal opinions about these things. You do not change the way you enforce the law based on your personal opinions. You enforce the law as it is, as you understand it, as, as to the best of your ability, that's your job. And if you're not doing that, 
then you are disrespecting the Constitution, you're disrespecting your job, you're disrespecting the rule of law, and you should pay the consequences of that. And, and indeed, Judge Moore was. He was thrown off the court. But the people of Alabama are proud of him. Ooh, he's a disruptor. He's a drainer of swamps. Because he disregards those laws. Those laws were passed by swamp people, by the establishment. So we shouldn't abide by them. That, that is, that is very, very, very dangerous. When we start thinking in terms like that, that we get to decide which laws to abide by and which laws not. Fight against the immoral, unjust laws. Fight against the immoral laws. That's what I do. That's what I, all of us should do. All the time. But that is us as private citizens, not as us as government officials. Ah, so anyway, you know, and put aside the fact that this Judge Moore guy is a uh, does not believe in the separation of church and state. Uh, you know, does not believe, therefore, in the Constitution. Uh, believes America is primarily a religious nation and wants to enforce that religion and cram it down our throats. Uh, he's a bad guy. He is a bad, bad, bad guy. And, and, uh, you know, if this is what it takes to defeat him, then I guess this is what it's going to take to defeat him. All right. You're listening to your Ron Brook show. And, and, uh, if you want in on the conversation, uh, happy to take your call. 888-900-3393. 888-900-3393. So give me a call if you want to talk about this or any of the other topic we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we will at the final segment of the show, so at the end of the second hour, I, I open up the phone lines for any questions, anything you want to ask me about any topic in the world. This is your opportunity to, to, to argue with me. This is your opportunity to complain. This is your opportunity to tell me why I'm wrong about anything. Or it's an opportunity to ask me a philosophical question, a political question, an economic question, a finance question, really anything you want to ask. So uh, last segment of the show Moment of reason, we call it. Uh, you can ask me anything. Call in 888-900-3393. In the meantime, feel free to call in with um, any questions you might have about the topics we are discussing. And uh, and love to hear from you and love to, love to chat with you. Uh, some other things I want to talk about today. I want to talk about antitrust. Um, there's a big case, uh, AT&T and Time Warner. Uh, I want to talk about more broadly about the antitrust laws and why I consider them, why Ayn Rand considered them probably the worst laws ever passed and, and why so many people support those laws and why, uh, you know, how they're being used today in this, this ridiculous case of uh, AT&T and Time Warner. Uh, you know, if we have time, I want to talk more, more about trade. You can never talk enough about trade in the world we live in today. It seems like so few people understand understand trade, value trade see the benefits of trade. Uh, so I uh, want to talk about that. Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. I want to talk about Saudi Arabia right now. Um, a lot going on in Saudi Arabia. Oh, my God. It's, it's, it's fascinating. It's fascinating to observe. It's fascinating to try to keep track with, uh, with everything that's happened. Basically, what we're seeing is the one branch of the royal family. So I don't know how you know if you know how the, the, the Saudi Arabia government works, but basically... Uh, there, there was a, uh, there was a king, King Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud. Now, Ibn means son of. So, this is King Abdul Aziz, son of Saud. And of course, Saudi Arabia is named after Saud. Now, King Abdul Aziz was the first modern king of Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia goes back a long time. It goes back into the 18th century. They've been, uh, from the Saud family, they've been, uh, many, many kings. But, uh, during World War One, or during the Ottoman Empire, uh, Saudi Arabia kind of, uh, somewhat disappeared. And then World War One, that whole area of, um, of the Middle East was occupied by the British. And, uh, the British basically promised Saudi Arabia back to the Saud family and basically placed King Abdulaziz ibn Saud back on the throne. Uh, he ruled from 1932 to 1953, so post World War One, he was the king of Saudi Arabia. If you want to, if you want insight, like insight and have fun at the same time into 
the Arabian Peninsula and what was going on there and, and that period of World War I, a, a, a fantastic movie, a, a great movie, a, a visually stunning movie, uh, one of the great acting performances of all time, Islamists of Arabia. And you, you, you I, know, I don't know how historically accurate it is, but it, it's, it's, it's reasonably accurate. So um, when King Abdul Aziz, uh, Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud died, um, one of his sons became the king. And then what happened? Every time one of those sons died, uh, a brother became the king. And uh, so the, the kingdom is passed from brother to brother. Now, in the meantime, remember, the, each, one of these, each one of these kings has many, many wives. The Muslims, there's no, there's no monogamy. So they have many, many wives. So they have many, 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 many children. And, you know, and if you have, within a few generations, you can see how massive, massive the royal family becomes in a sense of all the children of the king and the children's children and all the cousins and the nephews and the nieces. and Well, nieces don't count. Women don't count in Saudi Arabia. It's only the man. The royal family itself becomes massive. And, and the way... The government is structured, has been structured in the past, at least in Saudi Arabia, has been that basically these princes, these sons of the king or the sons of the the king's brothers, have uh, basically held all the power in the kingdom, both economic power, um, political power, military power, uh, you know, internal security power. They basically run the country. And... We are now on to kind of the last of King Abdulaziz's sons. He is the king today. That's King Salman bin, bin Abdulaziz. Why is it bin Abdulaziz? Because the son of Abdulaziz. Uh, Ibn, I think, is actually from Saud. So he's from the Saud family. Ibn, bin is son of. So it's King Salman, son of Abdulaziz. It gets complicated. Anyway, he's the king now. And... Uh, before the, the 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 supposedly heir to the throne was supposedly the son of his brother who was king before him, but about a year ago, a few months ago, uh, King Solomon got rid of uh, the heir to the throne and put his own son as the direct heir, uh, Crown Prince Muhammad bin Salman. So his name is Muhammad, and he's son of Salman, the king right now. I know, I've already lost you with all this bean, 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 but, you know, bear with me. Anyway, uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman has basically been taking full control over the Saudi royal family. And it's, it's, it, I think it's an unprecedented moves he's made. He's got rid of all his rivals, arrested them, fired them, dismissed them, put them aside. Uh, he's taken over all the important ministries himself. And uh, just recently, massive, massive arrests and detentions of members of the royal family. Plus, he, he promises to reform Saudi Arabia. All right, when we get back, we're going to talk more about this. You're listening to Iran Book Show, where you're going to hear about what happens in these, some of these foreign countries. We're in the Blaze Radio Network, and we're going to be back after this break. Brooke on the Blaze Radio Network. All right, we're back, and uh, before we go on with uh, my analysis of the Saudi royal family, which I'm sure you're having fun listening to, we'll, we'll get to the fun part in a minute, I promise, I promise. Uh, we got Daniel on the line, uh, Daniel wants to talk about Judge Moore, so I, I want to make sure we don't get too far away from that topic before we take his call. Hi, Daniel, how's it going? Hey, hey you're on, how you doing today, sir? Good, good. What's up? I just, I just have one question. Sure. I'm not saying he did it, I'm not saying he didn't do it. But I've heard some different analysis of the 
Washington Post story, and I'll come up with my own judgment when the facts actually come out. But I just had my question to you was, I haven't heard you come down nearly as hard on the judges of the Ninth Circuit Court as you are on Judge Moore. They're already in office for life, and they're not abiding by President Trump's executive orders for our national security. You mean the immigration orders? Yeah, the, the immigration yeah, so, so this, so this is the point, Daniel. You want to call when, yeah, when the Supreme Court rules on those orders, and and if, if when the Supreme Court backs President Trump on those orders, and it has partially already, then the Ninth Circuit Court is going to abide by them. They have no choice, and they will. I have no doubt they will. And if they don't, I will be the first one railing against them. It's it's. But in the meantime, uh, there are challenges to Donald Tr to to President Trump's uh, uh, executive orders as is appropriate under our Constitution. There are challenges in the court system. While those challenges are happening, until there has been a final ruling on those challenges, uh, you know, different courts are going to disagree, and that's what's happening right now in the country. Different courts are disagreeing. It's going to the Supreme Court. It's it's right. been there already, partially that, but resolved, but it hasn't fully been resolved. My point is about, especially this guy out in Hawaii, is that... The courts have nothing to do with national that's, security. That's not as true. Stands, that's as that's far not as true. The and, and says, yeah. Congress gave the President of the United States ultimate power over national security. So if he makes an executive order and says, hey, we're not taking anybody from these eight countries, they shouldn't be able to say a darn thing about it. No, that's not how the system of government of the United States works. That's that's not how the founders intended it to work. Everything the president done, the president does. You should be able to question. You should be able to uh, oppose. You should be able to bring before a court of law. The president is not above the law, above uh, any criticism or any questioning or any challenges on any aspect of his job. So uh, even it, even when it comes to national security, the fact is that it is Congress that declares war. It is Congress that approves treaties. It is Congress that decides how much money goes to the Defense Department. On, on every aspect, there is a balance of power. So the president can't just go out and do foreign policy all by himself unquestioned. The Congress can do whatever it wants. And the courts are there if... Uh, uh, if anybody perceives something that the president or Congress does that it's unconstitutional, it is your duty to go to the courts and challenge what the president has done. And, and this whole thing of executive orders, if the founding fathers saw what Bush, Obama, and Trump are doing with executive orders, they would have flipped over. They never wanted the president to have as much power as we're giving the president. We've created an imperial president, a president with far more executive powers than the founding fathers would have ever, ever wanted the executive branch to have. Uh, we believed in limited government with limited power to the president and limited power to the, to the, to, to, to Congress. So absolutely you can question what, uh, what the executive branch does. You can question executive orders, even executive orders that have to do with immigration, even executive orders that have to do with immigration that couched as national security issues, you can question those through the court system, and ultimately, the Supreme Court will rule one way or the other. Now, if Donald Trump had said, if President Trump had said, it's an emergency, we have to do this because there's an imminent threat, nobody would have challenged that. That is not what was presented. What was presented was a plan to revamp uh, immigration uh, for security reasons in a particular way. That plan has been challenged. That plan will go to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court would rule. We are a nation of rules, not a nation of men, not a nation of executive orders. Uh, and this is this is actually, I, I believe, agree or disagree with Trump's executive order. This is a beautiful process. This is how a republic works. We should celebrate this process. And and I know in Fox News you have all these experts saying, oh no, this is this is wrong. Well, let's see if the Supreme Court says 
if the Supreme Court, uh, uh, which is conservative right now, let's see if they go after this judge in Hawaii and say it's it's not your purview. I don't think that's what they're going to rule. They're going to rule, yeah, this is an issue that should have come to us. Here's our decision, one way or the other. Cool. That, that's the way the system works, and it's great. By the way, if Obama had done something through executive order that was national security, that Republicans had felt had thought was wrong and and bad, they would have gone to a judge, probably not in Hawaii, they probably, probably would have gone to a judge in Alabama and got that executive order suspended until it reached the Supreme Court just the same way Democrats did with what President Trump did. It, it's fascinating to me that uh, anything Republicans do, rep this is my comment about tribalism, anything a Republican president does is okay with Republicans and anything a Democratic president does is not okay with Republicans and the flip, the flip case. So let's be objective about this. There are too many executive orders. The, the executive branch is way too powerful, much more powerful than the than the than the uh, than the founders intended, and the courts have every right to review uh, presidential executive orders. <coughs> Thanks, Daniel. I appreciate the call. Right. And uh, if anybody else wants to give a call and talk about uh, Judge Moore, uh, you know, feel free to do so. I'm going to take a quick break because. <coughs> oh, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a, a, a cough thing coming, so I'm going to take that offline. All right, you're listening to the Ron Book Show on the Blaze Radio Network, and we'll be back in uh, in a couple of minutes. This is the Yaron Book Show, the Blaze Radio Network. This is the Yaron Brooks Show. All right, we're back. And it, it seems like I've uh, stuck a bit of a nerve with the uh, Judge Moore controversy. And we've got Seth on the line. Hey, Seth, how's it going? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How about you? Excellent. Excellent. Good. Well, I'm a longtime fan. I don't agree with you on everything. Um, oh, that's shocking. I, I, <laughs> I do admire your, uh, your uh, leadership in, in those parts of uh, objectivism. The only main issue is uh, Trump, actually. Yep. Uh, and that is um, that, again, he's not perfect, but I just, when you bring up uh, Senator or candidate Moore, um, I agree with you that he's definitely compromised in many different ways, but I would propose that um, Hillary Clinton was more compromised and more above the law. And as a result, given her attempt to become president, was more of a threat to the country. So I'm, my question is, while I agree with you on more, uh, why didn't you apply the same concern with having a potential president who was even more compromised and more uh, above the law? Well, well, I did. I mean, I, I think all our candidates are compromised and, and, uh, and anti-Constitution, yep. and I don't think there's anybody out there in the political world qualified to be president of the United States, and almost nobody qualified to be a senator. 90% of them are not qualified. <laughs> And I, I certainly don't think Donald Trump is qualified to be president, and I and I think Hillary Clinton wasn't qualified to be president. And you could argue, and and I'm listening to the idea that Hillary Clinton w w was was less qualified and should not have been president. And that's fine. I didn't vote for Hillary, and I didn't vote for Trump because I think both are abominations when it comes to what it means to be president of the United States, what that job entails, and what that responsibility entails, and in in and what that job symbolizes maybe because i'm an immigrant i still have this vaulted view of what it means to be president of the united states and and uh, you know I, I i just don't see any of these people being coming president the thing the thing about judge moore and and uh you know we can debate donald trump some other time but the thing about judge moore is that there are few people out there who are proud of the fact that they flaunt the law, uh, 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 you know, don't consider themselves completely above the law, talk about it, um, don't hide it. Hillary at least had the, um, uh, what do you call it, the decency to pretend she wasn't a crook, to pretend she wasn't above the law, to pretend well, that, that, true, that, that the foundation and all of that was not a scam. 
No, this guy, I, I, I'll let you speak in a minute, Seth. I, I can't hear you if you speak while I'm speaking. I just can't hear what you're saying. Um, this guy actually says, I don't care what the Supreme Court rules. I'm going to do what they have the hell I want. And even while he's a judge, I mean, that to me is so much worse for a, for a, somebody in politics. I'm not saying he's a worse human being than Hillary Clinton, but in terms of what it means to be in government, the thing you have to at least say, you have to at least claim, you have to at least, even if you're pretending, is to say that I will uphold the law no matter what. That's the oath you, of office you take. And yet this guy took an oath of office when he was appointed to, uh, a judge, and he completely ignored it and, and pretended that it doesn't exist. So I find that reprehensible. Now, let me also say, a million people. Uh, have talked about how evil Hillary Clinton was and how uh, criminal her activities were. There were whole networks on television dedicated to un uh, revealing all this and to exposing it. Nobody is talking about Judge Moore. Nobody is talking about this issue. Now, Democrats don't talk about it because they don't want to talk about the rule of law before their own reasons. Republicans don't talk about it because they're part of the tribe and Republicans don't attack Republicans. So I'm the only voice out there saying, that I'm going to hold Republicans up to high standards, and I'm going to uphold any government official up to high standards. And I'm, I'm the only person talking about Judge Moore in this capacity. Plus, I think we have to remember that he doesn't believe in separation of church and state, which I think is one of the most important things to believe in, in, in if you're going to be a public official. Uh, but it is flaunting of the rule of law is just ab an abomination. And again, what I I'd like to point out the hypocrisy of Republicans going after football players for kneeling and not going after Judge Moore for ignoring uh, Supreme Court rulings. All right, sorry, that was a long rant. Go ahead, Seth. Tell mind. me why I'm wrong. <laughs> well, again, I have, we have to put everything in perspective because you got a, a lot of responsibilities trying to be um, you know, a leader in objectivism, and I give you credit for that. But I just think we all can have a tendency to overlook the threats. And when the issue of Hillary Clinton comes up, she was so above the law and so corrupt. And a national security standpoint, she Fine. sold assets, secrets, uh, she lost. all kinds of favors. Right, but the threat by a hair. And I think the threat of Hillary Clinton was much more than all 99 or 100 corrupt senators. I, and they're all corrupt. But I, I don't Hillary believe that. Clinton I believe that somebody, the, I believe that somebody... Who like uh, like a more who says I don't care what the Supreme Court rules, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell my clerks to do whatever they they believe their conscience knows no matter what the Supreme Court rules no matter what Congress uh, what what laws pass I think the idea of electing somebody like that is is a new low in American politics they're all corrupt in in a variety of different ways they're all taking payments under the table we know that they're all they're all leaking secrets they're all uh you know making money i mean think of how many of these politicians left and right go into politics poor and come out rich they're all corrupt in that way but to 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 be a government official and say that's the move towards authoritarianism which i think is the most dangerous tendency left and right that we have in America. It, it started with executive orders under Bush. It, it became even worse with the disregard for the rule of law under Obama and his blatant disregard for contracts, his blatant disregard for agreements, his blatant authoritarianism with all his um, uh, executive orders. And it continues now with Donald Trump's executive orders, with Donald Trump's uh, 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 kind of... Uh, 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 resentment towards Congress and resentment towards the Constitution, and now with with Judge Moore, what I believe is the biggest threat to American security in the world today is not Al Qaeda, it's not ISIS, it's not Muslims, it's not Hillary Clinton. In my, it is the movement towards more and more authoritarianism, left and right, and I think the Democrats and Republicans are all responsible for this, and I'm going to call it out. Not just because I'm a, I, I, I have a responsibility as an objectivist, but as a responsibility as an American, as somebody who loves this country, as somebody who loves the founders, who loves, deeply, deeply loves the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. This is the last bastion and symbol for freedom on earth. And if America goes, the world goes. And America is drifting slowly but systematically, election after election, president after president, towards authoritarianism and and I am going to call it 
out as I see it, and I'm going to keep calling it out. And I would rather take corruption. I would rather take people who steal, but who are incompetent and impotent, than than people who are going to ultimately take over this country as authoritarianism. And you know, I spoke up against Obama. I didn't have a, I didn't, I wasn't on the blaze back then, so I didn't have quite the platform. Uh, I, 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 I would speak out against Hillary if she was president right now. I would lamb blast her every single week, constantly, uh, I, I, all the time. But I am here to, to, I don't care if the drift towards authoritarianism comes from Trump or Hillary or Obama or Bush. I will call them all out there. I don't care if it comes from, 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 uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, the Pope. I don't care where it comes from. I will call out the drift towards authoritarianism. And if you think I emphasize more the drift that comes from Republicans, I do. Because I think that there are plenty on the blaze and on other kind of so-called right-wing networks who bland blast the left all the time. I would like the blaze and I would like other networks that are on the so-called right to do a little bit of soul searching in terms of who they support and, and, uh, you know, what is being done in the name of the Constitution in the name of the founders, in the name of, of the Republic. So, yeah, I'm going to be more brutal towards people who seemingly are similar to me than I am to people who are obviously completely and utterly different from me. I don't know if that makes any point? sense, Seth. I, it does, but I think you're just overlooking, with all due respect, you're over, I would say you're overlooking in a, and this might be controversial, but as an objectivist, I would make the claim that on this issue, not, not on any other, I haven't seen you any, any other contradictions, <laughs> actually, I've, I've read you and I've listened to you speak, I, I met you once, I would just say on this one issue, you might be allowing your emotion uh, to get a little too involved and maybe precede your logic on Trump, because maybe because you're an immigrant, or maybe for another reason, but this is... Oh, well, let, let me tell you, I, see a con- I hate... A, a, a contradiction. I hate Bill and Hillary Clinton more than anything in the world. If it was just based on emotion, all I would talk about is what scumbags they are and how horrible they are and what awful people they are and what kind of a president he was and talk about sexual harassment. Why people are talking about Bill Clinton as the sexual harasser in chief and who legitimized it by doing it in the White House. You talk about Judge Moore a dating 17-year-old. What was, what was Bill Clinton, president of the United States, doing in a closet with Monica Lewinsky, a, a young a young uh, uh, intern, she wasn't quite 17, but she was young, and he was president. Talk about power. So, no, I, I don't think this is emotion. This is, this is really trying to be objective and trying to see where's the threat really coming from and what are people talking about and what are people not talking about. And if everybody's talking about something and they're doing a decent job of it, you don't need me to add on. What you need me to talk about is what I'm uniquely qualified to talk about. And what you need me to talk about is about issues that other people won't because I think of the, of the tribalism. So I am going to call out Trump because nobody else will. Because the left, when they call out Trump, they call him out on the wrong things. And they call him out on stupid things. I don't call out Trump on the same things the left does. So I'm going to call out Trump because somebody needs to. I'm going to call out Judge Moore because I think everybody should be calling out Judge Moore. I'm going to call out Republicans when they fail to to truly repeal Obamacare because they promised us for seven years to do it. And I'm not going to do it from a left perspective. I'm not going to do it from a neoconservative perspective. I'm going to do it from a radical for capitalist perspective. And I'm going to call them out on the stupid tax bill that where they had a historical opportunity to do something significant and what they're doing is minor and insignificant. I'm going to call the right out because somebody needs to do it who's not on the left. And and the other thing I wanted, I, I have to do is present to the world that there's an alternative. You don't have to be a Republican. You don't have to be a Democrat. How about being a capitalist, a, 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 a pro-constitution, pro-founding father, lover of liberty? And if you are, you do not have a home in the Republican Party, and you do not have a home in the Democratic Party. So maybe it's time either for a third party or for some of us just to say, you know what, we're going to criticize all of them, we're going to criticize both sides, and we're going to present to the world that there is a third opportunity, there is a third way, there is an alternative, and maybe that will lead to a third party ultimately, because I think we need a third party in this country, because the the Republicans are so corrupt now, it's hard to differentiate them from Democrats, and on the issues where they are differentiatable, 
That's not a word. Anyway, it's not good stuff. It's primarily on things like like religion and, and, and on social issues. So I think there needs to be a different way, and I'm going to articulate an alternative way, and I'm going to slam the left and the right when I when I see them doing things that are wrong. Now, who's the bigger risk? Who's the bigger threat to, to the United States of America? We can all have opinions about that, but at the end of the day, I don't influence public policy. I don't influence public opinion that much. Uh, wh- whoever's w- going to win is going to win. I don't know who the biggest threat is. I, I think the right is going to be the biggest threat long term as a response to the corruption of the left. I think the left is setting the stage for the authoritarianism of the right ultimately. But but how it pans out, I don't know. I just know it's going to be bad and I'm going to fight it. And I'm going to fight both sides because they're both responsible. All right, you're listening to Ron Book Show. And we're in the Blaze Radio Network. And we'll be back to talk about all kinds of stuff after this break. Seth, thanks for the call. Applying the principles of rational self-interest and individual rights on your radio. It's the Yaron Brooks Show on the Blaze Radio Network. Welcome to a discussion of radical fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, laissez-faire capitalism, and individual rights. The Yaron Brooks Show starts now. All right, we just, um, I think we finished the conversation with Judge Moore for a while. I'm sure there'll be other opportunities to talk about Donald Trump and, and his presidency uh, in, in the future. I, as, as those of you who listen to the show, I'm not a fan of Trump's. I'm not saying he is worse than Hillary Clinton. I've never said that. I'm just saying I'm not a fan of Trump's. And I will continue to criticize and it, things that he does that I don't agree with. And uh, All right. I, I want to switch to Saudi Arabia because I think fascinating things are happening in Saudi Arabia. Or at least I hope so. And uh, exactly what happens there has huge impact on us. Uh, why does it have a huge impact on us? Because the fact is that the Saudi royal family and Saudi billionaires, millionaires, whatever, uh, Saudi charities are the largest funders of terrorism, maybe the second largest funders of terrorism after Iran in the world. Every time you see a radicalized individual, they were radicalized by somebody who was funded or trained by the Saudis. You see, a long time ago, more than 200 years ago, the Saudi war family, the Saud family, cut a deal with a sect of religious fanatics called the Wahhabis. The Wahhabis wanted to return to fundamentalist, script-based, jihad-based Islam. And they said that uh, the only way Islam would ever achieve its glory days again is if they went back to a strict interpretation of Sharia law. And basically the deal was that we, you Wahhabis, rally uh, the people around us as monarchs, and we will leave the spiritual world. We will leave the teaching. We will not challenge your dominance of the teaching of Islam. So you get religion, we get the state. Separation of state to church, right? And uh, we will run the state based on your spiritual guidance, you know, as long as you don't interfere with our ability to accumulate money, to go have orgies in Monaco, to drive fancy cars, to, 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 to hang out in the Western bars and drink and do all that. As long as you don't interfere with that, you can preach whatever you want to preach, fund whatever you want to fund. And what's happened over the last... Certainly over the last 40 years, since 1979, is partially in order to compete with Iran. The Wahhabis uh, have, have uh, basically gone out there and helped fund all the radicalized Islamic movements around the world. So they, they were behind Al-Qaeda. They were at least originally very sympathetic to the Muslim Brotherhood and funded the Muslim Brotherhood and helped the Muslim Brotherhood when the Egyptians kicked them out. They were ultimately funding and behind ISIS. They are behind every mosque in the United States or in Pakistan, or any madras, the, 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 the school that teaches Islam, in Pakistan or in Afghanistan that ragula- radicalized people to join the Taliban or, or any one of the Islamist terrorist organizations. All of that, if it's Sunni, 
The Muslims are either Shiite or Sunni. If it's Sunni, it's funded by Saudi Arabia. And the royal family has basically stayed out of it. I think some members of the royal family support this, fund it, encourage it. Other members of the royal family just stay out of it. They're too busy with the orgies or whatever. And, uh, you know, they've been trying to be friends with the United States, so they don't want to be perceived as enemies of the United States. But as the as the information leaked out on 9-11, it's clear that there was a Saudi at least linked to the royal family connection to the 9-11, 9-11 terrorist attack. The Saudis were involved. Saudi officials from the royal family were involved. And remember, this royal family constitutes thousands of people because of how many wives each man can have and because how many wives each king has had and how many children they have. They have lots of children from lots of wives, and they're just thousands of these siblings. So it's a massive royal family, which controls every aspect of life in Saudi Arabia except religion. That they have given over to the Wahhabis. Now comes this Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And he is 32 years old. And he has been educated in the West. And he has consolidated power. He is the defense minister. He's basically in charge of internal security and in charge of economic policy. He is the heir to the current king, Salman bin Abdulaziz. That means Salman, son of Abdulaziz. And he will become king, unless there's a coup or unless he gets killed. But Prince Mohammed bin Salman is expected to be king. Indeed, it's expected that Salman will uh, will actually um, resign as king, abdicate. Abdicate is the formal word. Abdicate as king in order to allow a smooth transition so his son can take over. Anyway, he's 32, and he claims to be more modern. He claims to want to reform Saudi Arabia. He claims to want to take away some of the religious authority from the Wahhabis. He has actually put some Wahhabi preachers, some of the more radical Wahhabi preachers, in jail. He has just recently arrested dozens of his own family members on charges of corruption, which is bizarre because... Of course, they're corrupt. Everybody's corrupt. The, the whole basis of the Saudi economy is corruption for the royal family, sucking out all the wealth created, very little of it, all, almost all from oil. But so to me, it's more than just, it's not really corruption. What it is is a power grab. He's eliminating all his cousins and, and, and his and other family members who might have claim to the throne or might have different ideas about policy. Now, at the same time, he's also telling the West, we're going to reform. We're going to allow women to drive. We're going to, we're going to loosen up our religious restrictions. We're going to reduce our support of some of this, these radicalized mosques overseas. We're going to shut down some of these Wahhabi extremists. And, you know, he's also in the process of taking the Saudi Arabian oil company. I mean, it's funny to call it a company because it's basically the oil family. Um, and take it public, and they, they want to float 5% of it, and, and they think that by the time it's, it's finished, it would be valued at well over a trillion dollars, which will make it the largest publicly traded company in the world, more valuable than Apple and Google combined, I think. Uh, and the problem is that if they, f- if they take the company public in London or in New York, then they're going to have to abide by London and New York kind of disclosures and rules. And they don't want to. They don't want to disclose how the money's used. They don't want to disclose where the money goes. So now they're talking about, oh, maybe, maybe we'll just do it on the Saudi stock exchange. So a huge amount of going on in Saudi Arabia right now. It's fascinating. At the same time, at the same time, they claim that the money they get over a hundred billion dollars from this sale of stock, they're going to use to divest the economy. I mean, by 2020, or at the very least, latest by 2030, Oil will not be the primary source of revenue, the primary source of income for Saudi Arabia, that it will have a diverse economy. Really? Is that really, is that even a possibility? Do they have the resources? Do they have the, never mind the capital, the money? Do they have the brain power? Do they have the people? <coughs> the expertise, the knowledge to do that? It's interesting. So the, 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 he's got a whole plan. He's going to reveal, I think, next week on how to completely reform the Saudi economy. And at the same time, reduce the impact, the influence of 
Sharia law and, and, and the religious clerics on life in Saudi Arabia. And he's arresting his opponents, and he's not just arresting them. Last week, a helicopter carrying seven members of the royal family, relatively senior princes in this bizarre hierarchy, had an accident, and it crashed, and everybody died. Now, nobody believes it was an accident. And again, getting rid of opponents, consolidating power. Now, add to that the fact that he is in particular a hawk when it comes to his perception of the Iranian threat. He believes Iran is Saudi Arabia's number one enemy. He believes Iran is the number one destabilizing force in the Middle East. So he is fighting Iran in Yemen. Yemen is a country that was taken over by pro-Iranian forces, Shiite pro-Iranian forces, not long ago. And he is fighting a war in Yemen over uh, Iran's influence in the Arabian Peninsula. He is fighting, I think they initially supported ISIS because they were trying to fight Iranian influence in Iraq and Iranian influence in Syria. Now that kind of, that kind of blew up in their face. And now, you know, they're really worried because Iran is in Yemen to their south. Iran is in Iraq to the north. Iran is in Syria to the north. Iran dominates Lebanese politics to the northwest. And an interesting thing happened this week relating to Lebanon. The Prime Minister of Lebanon was visiting Saudi Arabia, and during that visit, he resigned and has not been seen since. <laughs> the intrigue just keeps building. <clears throat> he is a... Uh, he is a uh, Saudi-appointed prime minister, if you will, of, of Lebanon. Lebanon is dominated by Hezbollah. Hezbollah is a terrorist arm of Iran. And again, I think the Saudis are trying to make a, a play. They've told uh, Saudi Arabian citizens not to go to Lebanon, not to be in Lebanon, not to invest in Lebanon, a complete ban on Lebanon. So Saudi Arabia is playing a geopolitical game here, trying to protect the Middle East from Iran's influence. And, and I think a lot of this has to do with America's weakness. And, and you know, the, the fact that America is not leading, um, if you will, the attack on Iran, the, 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 the protection against Iran. Iran's developing new, uh, ballistic missiles. It's probably developing nuclear weapons. It's, um, it, it threatens not just Israel, but it threatens Saudi Arabia with those weapons. I wouldn't be surprised if you'll see the uh, Saudis trying to buy nuclear weapons from the Pakistanis, who are Sunnis. And what you're seeing is, is, a, is, a, is an arms race, a power struggle, uh, and it's fascinating. And, and partially what's happening is the Saudi Arabia is getting closer to Israel. Now, it won't actually declare that, but unofficially, there are talks constantly between Israel and Saudi Arabia, particularly about Iran and Syria and Iraq and Lebanon. And... Uh, one, suspect, one would suspect that if Israel actually attacked Iran because it viewed Iran as a threat, <coughs> a nuclear threat, that Saudi Arabia would actually let it use its airspace. I'm not sure the Americans, the Trump administration, would let Israel use Saudi airspace, um, but I think Saudi Arabia would. So alliances are shifting. And where's the United States in all of this? Nowhere. Nowhere. I mean, uh, uh, Obama... <laughs> basically had an anti-American foreign policy that basically said, um, yeah, we're going to support our enemies. Uh, we're going to let ISIS grow up. We're, we're not going to fight them. We're, we're, we're going to leave the Iranians alone because they're not a threat. We're going to kind of deal with them, and, and we're going we're gonna, to you know, just be friendly with everybody. Trump um, has, I think, no foreign policy. So it's not that he hates America. He just doesn't have anything. Uh, he's done nothing in the Middle East so far other than dance with the Arabian princes in the Saudi Arabia, uh, demand very little from them, uh, demand almost nothing from them. The State Department actually was backing this guy, uh, the Solomon's opponents, for a while. Uh, so there is no foreign policy in the Middle East. We don't know what we're doing. It's basically being run by the Russians and the Iranians. Russia and Iranian now, Russia and Iran are now the dominant forces in the Middle East, other than, of course, Israel. Uh, the United States is out of the game. It, it's not a participant. It's, it's, not, it's not there. And the Saudis feel that vacuum and are trying to fill it. Now, I'm not saying the United States should be there. I, I think it should because it should defend itself, and I think there are people who want to kill us, and, uh, and, and we should be defending ourselves from those people. But I think we've been too involved 
in the intrigues of the Middle East. Let the Middle Easterners handle the intrigues. All we need to do, and, and this will be my final statement on this issue, all we need to do as America is say, if you mess with us, we'll destroy you. If you fund mosques where people get radicalized and kill Americans, we'll destroy you. If you fund terrorism that kills Americans anywhere in the world, we'll destroy you. So just behave, people. We're not going to intervene in your internal matters. You're not, we're not going to intervene in your intrigues. Just beware. Uh, oh, by the way, Iran, if you, if you really are developing nuclear weapons, we'll destroy you. We're not going to have nuclear weapons in the hands of a theocracy dedicated to the death of America. Ain't happening. Not under, not under Iran Brooks' watch. Maybe under Trump's watch. Maybe under Obama's watch. Maybe under Bush's watch. But not under my bu I, Well, I'm not going to have a watch because I'm never going to be president. All right. All right. It's about that time. Yeah, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to talk about antitrust laws. Uh, unless, unless we've got any callers who want to talk about Saudi Arabia or the Middle East. Uh, no. So for now, we're going to skip over to a new topic. We're going to talk about antitrust and... Uh, What's happening there? And uh, we'll be back after this brief message. Best-selling author, prolific media contributor, PhD in finance. This is the Yaron Brook Show, the Blaze Radio Network. This is the Yaron Brooks Show. All right, we're back. We're giving you a lot of ground today, uh, giving you a quick history lesson and a political lesson in, uh, in, in Saudi Arabia. I do recommend, I've got a course, a, a series of lectures, I think it's four or five, four lectures, on the history of the Middle East. It's, it's powerful stuff. Uh, it's the best introduction you would ever get to uh, the Middle East. And the best way to get it is on my new website, uh, com. Y-A-R-O-N-B-R-O-O-K dot com, uh, show dot com. And if you go there, and if you go uh, to, uh, there's a tab there, watch Iran or listen to Iran, and there's, uh, under that, there's uh, history lessons, Iran's history lessons. And go to those, and, and I highly, highly recommend my course on, two courses really. One is on the history of the Middle East, and then the other one is on the rise of Islamic totalitarianism, on the rise of Al-Qaeda and ISIS and the Muslim Brotherhood, and, and the whole kind of militant uh, jihadi uh, version of, uh, of Islam. And uh, I think you'll really enjoy it if, you, if you're interested in, in American foreign policy, if you're interested in the history of the Middle East, if you're interested in what we should be doing in the Middle East. Uh, it is a fantastic resource. You can get that on yaronbrookshow.com. Go to listen and to history lessons, and it's all there. Generally, uh, go visit my website, and uh, I think you'll find a lot of cool content. Uh, uh, some of the Blaze old Blaze episodes are there. Also, um, uh, other content that I put out, videos, uh, YouTube stuff. Oh, subscribe to my video channel. Please, please subscribe to my video channel. I'd really appreciate it. Uh, all right, so we are going to talk about, I want to talk about antitrust. Antitrust is in the news because AT&T is trying to buy Time Warner. AT&T is both a telephone company, a wireless telephone company. It's also a wired telephone company. It's also um, it provides internet via, um, I guess, uh, uh, fiber. It also provides uh, cable shows via fiber, but also via its ownership of DirecTV. So AT&T owns all these kind of end user outlets. It, it, it owns, it, the, it, you know, internet bandwidth and it owns cable bandwidth and it owns satellite bandwidth. And then it's buying Time Warner. And what is Time Warner? Time Warner produces stuff. It, it creates movies. Time Warner produces TV shows. It owns lots of TV stations. And basically what, uh, what AT&T is trying to do is it is trying to vertically integrate the space. It, it, what it is trying to do, it, it is trying to own everything from content to delivery to your television or to delivery to your phone or to delivery to your iPad. And, you know, over the years, 
it's been questionable about whether antitrust would allow this. And right now, a lot of people with the Trump administration thought, oh, Republicans are usually a little loose on antitrust. So they will let this deal through. And it's been, it's been in front of the various regulatory agencies, I think, for 13 months. And it hasn't been approved yet. And now it appears that the FCC might challenge the deal. And rumor were, was, on Friday at least, that they were trying to push AT&T either to divest their direct TV offering or to divest CNN. Uh, uh, Time Warner, uh, not Time Warner, the, the, uh, Turner, Turner Broadcasting, which Time Warner owns, which includes CNN in the packet. Now, this raises tons of issues. Tons of issues. One, um, are they trying to penalize CNN because Donald Trump hates CNN? That's an obvious question. This is the problem with a president who gets into the mode of criticizing specific media companies and favors some media companies over other media companies explicitly and, and attacks them and, and, and ridicules them and denounces them. And then when something like this happens, you have to think. The first thought that came into my mind was, is this a Donald Trump vendetta? And if so, massive violation of the First Amendment, massive violation of free speech massive and unconstitutional and everything else. But everybody's saying, no, 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 it's not that. <coughs> this is on antitrust grounds. This is on legal grounds. But what's the antitrust case? CNN is certainly not a monopoly. It doesn't dominate the industry. Uh, uh, Turner Broadcasting doesn't dominate the industry. Uh, DirecTV doesn't dominate the industry. This is a vertical integration. Horizontal integration is when you buy somebody who does the same thing as you. Here you're not buying the same thing as you, you're buying your suppliers. That doesn't create a monopoly. Now, the danger is, this is what they say, the danger is that uh, Time Warner will take its content and offer it for less money to DirecTV and to at and uh, I guess, cable, than to other cable companies, like, you know, I, I, Cox or whatever, uh, other cable companies. Or like Dish, Dish Network, right? Now, that is an antitrust argument, right? But one of the ways that's been dealt with in the past is that the deal has been approved on condition that the company guarantees that they will offer the same term to uh, the, the inside the company, the direct TV, and the outside the company, the other cable companies. So you could have that. You wouldn't have to force them to divest. So one wonders what is actually going on. What, what, what is the FCC thinking? Why are they doing this? We've seen no real logical explanations to any of this. It all sounds pretty voodoo to me. And it sounds a little bit that maybe this is indeed vindictive. But what this really is, is an opportunity for me to talk more broadly about antitrust laws. Because I hate antitrust laws. I think antitrust laws are the most unjust laws ever created. I think they're anti-American. I think that they're to penalize success, to penalize large companies. You know how you become large? How does a company become large? How does a small company get to be a big company? How does small business get to be big business? By being successful. By offering great values. By offering great products or services. By being really good at what they do by beating the competition, by doing what American capitalism, what capitalism says is good. Says is good. And antitrust is an abomination because it attacks exactly that. It attacks bigness. It attacks success. It attacks the ability of businesses to grow bigger and be more successful. It, it attacks private voluntary choices that businesses make that the government has no business in interfering in. All right, so when we, when we're going to take a, a break here, hard break. Um, and, uh, but when we get back, we're going to talk more about this. And I want to tell you a little bit the history of antitrust, where it comes from, and all the evil it has done, and all the disasters it has really, uh, it has really created. This is, this is bad, bad law, and, and it's about time. Somebody did something to do away with it. Now, somebody, somebody writes here, Trump has free speech. No, he doesn't. He's president. It's different when you're the government.
You won't hear traditional political views here. This is the Yaron Brooks Show on the Blaze Radio Network. The Yaron Brook Show. What is this music? Oh, man. My, my listeners are always going to get up on their feet and start dancing. Is that what we want? We're going to leave the, the leave the listening to the show and start. Uh... All right. So um, we're talking about antitrust. We're talking about this AT&T mojo. And, and somebody, somebody online says uh, um, CNN is an entertainment company, not media. All right. If, if you want to hold that, that's fine. But then Fox is too. I mean, I, what drives me nuts is, again, the, 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 the tribe, right? Because I disagree, because it's their television network, and clearly it's leftist, then it's not real. But mine, which is just as bad, is real. Uh, CNN, Fox, all the same garbage uh, in, terms of, in terms of any any semblance of journalism or objectivity. Neither one has journalism or objectivity going uh, going forward. All right. Uh, so we're talking about antitrust, and we've already got a caller. This is a good. It's a good topic, and and you guys should call on it because there's a lot of confusion about antitrust. There's a lot of um, a lot of people who think of themselves as capitalists, but but are for antitrust laws. And and let me tell you, antitrust laws and capitalism uh, contradict each other. You can't be for both. Uh, so let's dig in deep. Let's 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 go for this. All right, we've got Damus on the line from Washington. Hopefully not yeah, D.C. D.C. Washington yeah. State, maybe. Washington D.C. <laughs> Washington D.C. Oh, I'm sorry for you. I hate Washington D.C. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm in law school at GW, and I'm one of my uh, focus areas is antitrust law, and I'm in that boat of um, someone who considers himself a capitalist. But I'm studying antitrust law, and it, you can, it's hard to balance that line. So my question, I've been dying to ask you this question for a long time. Sure. Does, does uh, a free market have anything to say about a cartel uh, situation where you have a bunch of businesses getting together and they say, we're only going to produce this product at this price, and everyone agrees? Because it, it can't, it, it's not as simple as saying um, a new entrant would come in and disrupt all that because they can always... Uh, given their numbers, uh, just over outproduce that person and run them out of the market. So, so it, I'm okay yeah. if, the, if, the situ- if the situation is the free market has nothing to say about it, but I'm just curious, what, 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 what do we do about that type of situation? Well, let me break this down into two issues. One is, should the government have anything to say about it? And, and my, my argument is absolutely not. Uh, the government is there to protect individual rights. It's there to protect, to, to protect us from fraud, it's there to protect us from deceit, from uh, uh, stealing, from, uh, you know, crooks and criminals and murder and rape and all, all that stuff. It's right. not there to protect us from businessmen who decide to, let's say, collude in this case. There's no individual right at stake. Uh, they're not deceiving us because the cartel is out in the open. They're not, uh, they're not uh, lying to us. We don't have a right. I don't have a right to buy product X for a certain amount, and now they've raised my prices. That is not a violation of rights. I don't have a right to buy any good in any particular right. So when I when I think about should the government be in this, I think, is there a rights violation going on? And if there's no rights violation, my answer is no, the government shouldn't be in this. So I'm not a, I'm not a utilitarian. I don't look at this and say, is society going to be better off if X, Y, and Z? Uh, I am a rights, I believe in rights. Now, I also believe society is better off because I think society is better off when the only thing government does is protect rights. And I think once it starts saying, oh, no, but in this case or in that case, and it's a very, very intensely slippery slope, and soon enough the government is running our lives like it is today. So, no, unless there's a rights violation, in other words, unless there's thievery going on, the government has no role in the economy. It, it should not be, again, unless contracts are violated. Something, 
that the government is responsible for. There's nothing here. The government is not responsible for uh, prices. The government is not responsible for maximizing consumption or maximizing production or any of that. The government should not get involved in any of this. Now, let's turn to the economic issue. Would the free market deal with it? And the answer here is absolutely yes, and it does it all the time, and cartels never work, and cartels break up constantly. There is a wonderful book by, uh, by uh, um, oh, I forget his first name, but Folsom, F-O-L-U-S, Fol, S-U-M, F-O-L-S-U-M. He's, a, um, he's an economist who lives in Michigan, uh, and he teaches, he might teach at Hillsdale College, I'm not sure, but, but, uh, but he's in Michigan. And he documents, uh, he, he wrote a history of Michigan entrepreneurs in the 19th century and the early 20th century. Michigan, for those of you who don't know, Michigan used to be the Silicon Valley of the United States. If you had a great idea, if you wanted to start a company, you went to Michigan. That's where the talent was. That's where the capital was. And the laws were such that you could pretty much do anything you wanted to do, again, as long as you weren't violating other people's rights and, and get away with it. In those days, there was a chemical cartel, a German chemical cartel. Uh, and they set prices for all chemicals in the United States. And a guy named Dow, you know him now from Dow Chemical, fought them. He was the new entrant. And there's several sections of the book that describe how he fought them with different tactics and how he crushed them. And I'll just give you one example because I thought it was so funny. And, of course, you couldn't do it today because of all the regulations, but it's kind of a neat example. So what the German companies did, Dow had, had figured out how to produce a certain chemical ch significantly cheaper than the Germans did. So uh, what the Germans did is they undercut his price in the United States. What they did was they lowered the price of their version of the chemical lower than what Dow could produce it without, ta without taking a loss. But, of course, they were losing money, a huge amount of money, because they had to drop it a lot because he had really increased efficiency significantly. And uh, and it w so what they had to do is raise prices in Europe. So they raised prices in Europe, and they lowered prices really, really low in the United States. So this is what uh, Dow did, right? Think about the, the guts it takes to do something like this. He bought up all their product in the U.S. He shipped it to Europe and sold it in Europe for lower prices than what they were selling their own. You see, he sold their own product in Europe for a price lower than what they were selling it, and thus undercut them in Europe. I mean, it's genius. Yes. My point is, get this book. Get the book. There's a lot of other examples. There are a lot of other books that describe these kind of things. Cartels don't survive. Part of the reason cartels don't survive is cheating. The cartel usually falls apart because some of the members start cheating. Right. Okay, thank you. I, that was my biggest... I, I knew I didn't want government involved, but I was just curious... Because when you're dealing with people and individuals, this is still something that they're concerned with. And if you tell them there's no answer, they're going to want government involved. So, uh, Well, I, but that's, I, that's where we need to teach them to think in principle. We need them to think right. in terms of individual rights. The, the question is not if there's no answer. Prices will go up. So what? The question is, is a right being violated? Is this the role of government? We have to get back to the discussion of what is the role of government and, and get away from a utilitarian discussion of how to maximize utility invented by, you know, it was projected by some person somewhere. We have to get back from these ideas that there's some perfect competition. And, and, and this is the great disaster that economists, uh, that e economists teach our children, perfect competition, this model where utopia is when all firms are exactly the same, have the same information, it produced the same product and everything's indifferentiable. That would be the most boring, pathetic, ridiculous society in human history. And of course, it's impossible, would never happen. But that's why they teach it. So we need to teach real economics. Real economics is about differentiation. Real economics is trying to establish monopoly power. It's trying to establish something that you're better at than anybody else. And, 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 and doing everything you can within the law to protect that differentiation. So, um, you know, the whole way in which we conceive of monopolies, the whole way in which we conceive of business, it, and the whole way in which we conceive of the role of government distorts all of this. So, um, so there is an answer, but, and the book is, just to repeat, 
The book is uh, the author is Burton Folsom, B U R T O N F O L S O M, and the book is called Empire Builders. Empire Builders. Thank you, Stuart, for digging that up for me. I always forget the name of the book, and uh, obviously can't spell the guy's name. But Burton Folsom, Empire Builders, highly, highly recommend that book. Everything he wrote is excellent. The Myth of the Robber Barons is another great one. He also wrote a good book on the Great Depression. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Damus. Thanks for calling. Appreciate the call. All right, we're gonna. Uh, I've got another call. Logan wants to talk about insider trading. Um, let me just say this about antitrust laws, and then <coughs> after the break, we're gonna take Logan's call because it's a bit of a switch of topic, and not not a, not a huge not a huge switch. Antitrust laws are typical government laws. They're written in an ambiguous way, and and maybe our law student can verify this. They're written in a purposefully ambiguous way. They're written in a way that you can interpret, that the government can interpret any way it wants, and therefore go after pretty much anybody. The fact is that almost every business person out there is in violation of antitrust laws at some point in their career. Think about it this way. This is an example Ayn Rand gave. If you charge for your product more than the competitors do, how do you get away with that? You must be a monopolist. So we can get after you as a monopolist. Because, again, the perfect competition model says everybody, you know, you can't charge more than somebody else unless you have monopoly power. So if you charge more than other people, they can come after you, and they have come after people for violation of antitrust laws because you have a monopoly. What if you charge less than everybody else, less than your competitors, significantly less than your competitors? Oh, that's not allowed either. That's called dumping. It's un undercutting, uh, undercutting competition, selling stuff for a loss is illegal, according to antitrust. This is how we can ban importation of steel and other products because we're claiming that these foreign companies are dumping. Just... And then, <clears throat> so that's in violation of the law and they can come after you. And then, of course, if your product is priced exactly the same as your competitors, same price as all, everybody else in the industry, then you must be colluding. That's collusion. That's cartel. And we go after you. Now, I know that's an over oversimplification. But it's not. <laughs> it, it's how this world functions and how our government functions. And when a government becomes unlimited, when it becomes unconstrained by the, 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 the idea of its protecting individual rights, it, it can do anything. And it can come after anybody. And it can go after anybody anytime it wants. And this is the history of the last 100 years, 130 years of antitrust law. 1890, antitrust laws, first anti Sherman Act was passed under Republican administration. Republicans always seem to pass the nastiest, worst regulation of business possible. All right. We're going to take a quick break here. You're listening to Ron Brooks Show on the Blaze Radio Network. Israeli military veteran and radical for capitalism. It's the Yaron Brooks Show on the Blaze Radio Network. Yaron Brook. All right, we're in that part of the show which we call Moment of Reason, where, where you get to ask me anything you want. Anything you want. Those of you on the various chats online, you can call in and, and ask instead of typing in and, and me not being able to read the question and not having the time to answer. And now's your opportunity. 888-900-3393, 888-900-3393. And we're going to go to Logan from Colorado. Hey, Logan. Hey, how's it going? I was just in Colorado. I flew to London from Denver. Direct oh. flight. No, oh, I must have missed you. Yeah. Well, I was wondering about it. Oh, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Sure. I was wondering about uh, insider trading because I was having a discussion with some family members and I was telling them I didn't see what the problem with it was and uh, one of them remarked that if I were really a capitalist, I have to be against anti or I'm sorry, uh, insider trading. And I really well, don't understand why somebody should go to jail over, you know, trading information or trading on knowledge that they already have. 
Yeah, so let's, again, again, I think it needs to be thought through and it needs to be, you need to really consider what are we talking about when we're talking about insider trading because it, it applies to a lot of different things. But let's start with, so, so this is the idea that if you have information that is not publicly available um, about a particular company, you are not allowed to trade on that information uh, because that gives you a so-called unfair advantage and you're not allowed to trade on that information and you could go to jail. So. This is true if you're the CEO of the company or, or, or somebody who works for the company or a supplier of the company or if you just happen accidentally across some information about the company. Like, I don't know, you went through the trash can and found some stuff. Um, if you have information that's not publicly available, theoretically, you're not allowed to trade on that information. Now, yeah, that is completely non-objective. That is absolutely ridiculous. And again, there's no violation of rights. You, as an investor, don't have a right to have a particular amount of information. You don't have a right to have equal information. There's no such thing as equal information. You don't have a right not to lose money on a trade. You don't have to, a right to be shielded from somebody else having access to information you don't have access to. That should all be open. So I agree that there cannot be laws against inside trading. However, I do think in a free market, there would be restrictions on insider trading. And what would those restrictions be? I can think of two entities that on a voluntary contractual level could restrict insider trading. One would be the exchanges. So the New York Stock Exchange could say, look, if you want to list on our exchange, if you want to trade through our system, um, and if you're the CEO or if you work for the company or if you do suits and things or if you're, they could set the rules however they want to set the rules then you have to commit to not using inside information. And if you do use inside information, you're violating the contract with us and we'll kick you off this exchange or whatever, right? So that would be one entity that has an incentive. And why would the, why would the um, exchange have an incentive? Because they benefit when there's high volume of trade. They benefit when there are lots of buyers and sellers. And the theory is that if there's a lot of insider trading going on, particularly from insiders within the company, then a lot of... Ordinary investors wouldn't participate. They just leave the market. And the exchange might say, look, um, we, we don't want that because we want the volume of trade, so we're, we're not going to allow insider trading of this type uh, to occur. And that would be fine. And then the NASDAQ could say, oh, we're going to allow it. Or the NASDAQ could say, we're going to not allow a different type of insider information not to be traded. And they'd compete, and we'd see which system works best. Uh, that's part of the problem, I think, with, with what we have today is not only insider trading laws, but accounting regulations. Because it is all centralized and top down from the government, we don't have an opportunity for people to compete over what's the best accounting standard, over what's the best rules for insider trading, or what's the best rules for listing companies and exchanges. Everything is cookie cutter determined by the government, and there's no competition and there's no innovation. So I think the exchanges would do something. The other entity that would do it is shareholders. So I think when you hire a CEO, suddenly as part of his employment contract, you would list certain things that he couldn't trade on. So for example, if the company wasn't doing well, you don't want your CEO to be allowed, for example, to short the company stock because then he has an incentive for the company not to do well and to tank it. They might be certain types of information that you as the owner of the company, the shareholder, want to have access to at the same time as the CEO does. And you don't want them to be able to trade before you have access to that information. But that is up to the shareholders and to the managers. And every company can be different. And every company can have different rules. And again, competition would determine what makes sense or what doesn't make sense because CEOs who don't like certain rules would leave and it would go work for other companies. And if they're better CEOs, the rules would have to change to adapt to the better CEOs. So I, I believe that all these issues, and they are issues that come up with insider trading, are resolved by the market. And, and the worst thing you can do, the worst, worst thing you can do is make laws about it and criminalize it. It's not a criminal. It's not criminal. Um, it, it is something that needs to be dealt with through contract law. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's not that I'm for insider trading. It's that I'm for letting the market decide. 
Yeah, and I, I figured that there's no reason that the government could be involved. You know, like you yes. said, it's completely subjective, and there's no clear definition of what is insider trading and what's not. Yes, no, just like the antitrust laws, the government leaves the, the insider trading laws purposefully ambiguous, purposefully murky, so that they can go after anybody. And it, it, indeed, a lot of their cases... Um, uh, you know what? Some courts will uh, uh, prosecute to uphold the guilty verdict. Other courts will overturn. It, it's very, very difficult to know um, whether you're committing insider trade or you're violating insider trading laws or not because the laws are so messed up. Uh, and that's sad. And that, that goes to the, back to the rule of law, the, the, the topic we started with. Laws should be clear. They should be objective. They should be understandable. The very fact that many of our laws today take hundreds of pages, that only a super-duper expert can understand what the hell they mean, is an indication of how statist and how anti-capitalist and far away from freedom we have moved. Laws should be objective, simple, easy to understand. Even on technical issues, efforts should be made to make them understandable. And as I've said over and over again, laws should only be passed in to define and protect rights. To define and protect rights. And rights need to be redefined occasionally because of technological change. How do you define property over the Internet? What do you do with intellectual property? All these things change over time. So I'm not against laws, but not many. You don't need that many. These things don't change that often. That's why you don't need a full-time legislature in a truly capitalist country economy. So, one of the signs that, again, we're heading towards authoritarianism and that our government is out of control is the fact that our laws are so ambiguous, so hard to understand, the fact that nobody knows when they're violating the laws. We need to go back to objective, objective rule of law. All right, you've been listening to Ron Book Show every Saturday at this time, this place. Talk to you next time. You're listening to The Yaron Brooks Show on the Blaze Radio Network.